Well, thank you, and uh, welcome everybody. And hello, Brian. Nice, nice to see you. Hi, Saul. Great to see you too. So Brian and I have been talking together about the work that he's been doing, bringing classical Greek tragedy into public discussions, and the work that I've been uh, doing with many colleagues, developing university and high school courses uh, and curriculum that can teach a scientific style of critical thinking uh, to students from you know, all fields and all ages, uh, which is, of course, intended to get at this issue of trust. And I, in fact, I, I think that uh, this is where the title of the session, Toolbox of Truth, come, came from, though I, I don't know about you, Brian, but I, I, I find it sounds like it's like a worrisome sound uh, that we're, that's a toolbox of truth, but. Uh, Indeed. So, so I think we, we had some more than an, you know like an hour's worth of, of discussions on uh, that we that we thought would be fun to talk about. But in the end, I, we just tried to come down with uh, just a few issues that we thought would be fun to discuss with everybody in just a few minutes uh, before uh, before the performance uh, that we'll have next. So, um, so I thought, may I, I would just kick off by uh, talking about a couple of things that uh, that struck me as potentially worrisome about the idea of, of uh, looking at Greek tragedy, um, you know, when we're trying to understand, uh, you know, trust in science. And may began because I realized that much of what we're teaching in, in the course that, that we've been developing um, is about how to think about the world probabilistically so that you can be thoughtful and then maybe even efficacious in, in a world that's, you know, that's always uncertain and always changing. And, but but I think of tragedy as telling us the opposite, that it's useless to even think of shaping your future. That's, you know, it's all fate. Uh, but but I, I guess that's not the way that you've been thinking about, about tragedy. Right. So one of the reasons that we're so excited to be presenting a Greek tragedy as a framework for talking about scientific truth uh, and engaging in a discussion about um, whose truth we believe um, is that, um, on the contrary, I would argue that ancient Greek tragedy, um, while it depicted and depicts characters learning too late, and in those milliseconds in which they learn too late, they've destroyed their families and themselves and generations to come, the impact of watching characters on stage learning too late on audiences counterintuitively is to raise us all into a cognitive state in which we become aware of the slim possibility of making a change before it's too late. So I would say at this, the heart of what happens in the theater, it's about altering consciousness in multiple ways, but bringing people into consciousness of um, what it takes to actually change when the stakes are this high and the habits are this well-formed and there are these multiple forces at work upon us, gods, fate, luck, government, the weather, all shaping our behavior within all of that um, to make a decision before it's too late. And the word character in English comes from a Greek word that means to in, um, inscribe. Uh, I, I would argue that these plays are about watching people make choices that ultimately inscribe their characters, that write their fates, but their choices. And watching people make choices when the stakes are of life and death, well, that seems like an appropriate thing to be doing right now at this critical juncture in our planet's history and for our humanity. And, and I gather that when you've been, uh, you, you've been using the style of, of public discussion, use, using theater as a way to, to get people to, to think and talk together, that, that they're having a lot of the same reaction, I think that you're saying that, the, that probably the, it was originally intended uh, to, to create, which is uh, that you, you watch these characters and you think, you know, we don't want to do that. <laughs> and, and that in some sense, you're, you're, it's, it's a way of, of um, of, of seeing where not to go. Well, tragedies are also, especially tragedies by Sophocles, like the one we're going to perform today, are also plays in which everyone is right. Everyone believes they're justified and right in what they're doing, and yet someone is going to die often. And I think that's also an appropriate lens through which to look at our current predicament. Um, everyone believes they're justified in doing what they're doing, else they wouldn't be doing it. Can we step back from the roles that we're playing and from our sureness of our righteousness and, uh, and our position and acknowledge our fallibility and acknowledge our mistakes and acknowledge um, you know, this very fundamental thing that makes us human. I think that's what tragedy brings us into consciousness of. And since we're on the subject of making mistakes in our conversation, um, I, was really, um, I was really struck 
um, talking with you, Saul, about how um, making mistakes uh, and acknowledging them and also figuring out exactly what the mistake was stands at the center of your vision for what science's role is in our lives. And, 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 and this question of toolbox for truth, it seems like this, this, this central idea of failing forward, of making mistakes and acknowledging them is at the center. And I was really moved by that. And I'd love to hear you talk more about that. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say that the, uh, that it, what this reminds me very much of the fact that, um, in some sense, what we're trying to teach in, in our course uh, often is that the, that the fun and the heart of science is often the hunt for what we have misunderstood or got wrong. Um, and it, you know, it, in the big or the small, I mean, it could be that we just misunderstood something and got something wrong in this little measurement that we were, that's part of some big study that we're doing. But it could be that we got something wrong in our understanding of how gravity works or something you know, really, really fundamental and deep. And that, in fact, the game of science is so much hunting for where we're going wrong at any given moment. And in the end, if you're going to trust science, the reason you trust it is because you're watching people who are absolutely trying to figure out where they're making mistakes and very aware of all the ways that they can fool themselves so, so, you know, so, so easily, so much of the time. Um, I, I mean, in fact, that's, you know, I think that's the reason I, I feel, you know, I've, when I feel comfortable going to get a vaccination, it's because I'm watching you know, my, my, the scientists around hunting for, you know, what could be wrong with, with, with anything that they're doing with, with in, in, in this, in this study. So, but, but, but then of course, my picture of tragedy um, was, was, was then very much on the opposite side where I was picturing that um, tragedy was sort of about punishing the, you know, the errors and punishing the stubbornnesses. Um, you know, you make the smallest error and you're out, you know, whereas of course in, in the sciences, the whole point is to be very open to making error, and that the the way you advance is by by recognizing the errors, and then and then and and then taking the next step. It's a very iterative process. Um, is yeah. does that fit or not fit in the uh, in the way that the, well, that the, the that this tragedy was working? You know. Well, I think in some ways I was listening to you talk and thinking about how, on one hand, there's this kind of um, utopian notion of science as a place where one can make mistakes, and that mis making mistakes and acknowledging stands at the center of the entire method. And yet you, you don't practice science in a bubble. You practice science in an incredibly litigious society uh, that, with an echo chamber of media uh, influencers that will appropriate things that scientists say and distort them. And um, the question of making a mistake, like, for instance, uh, wear a mask, don't wear a mask early in the pandemic can all of a sudden become the linchpin of whether people trust science or not. And that, that uh, conflict between practicing science in its pure form and science and its relationship to the rest of the world that doesn't put making value making mistakes. In fact, the rest of the world um, thinks that making a mistake is a bad idea and, uh, and doesn't celebrate its mistakes in the way that you have talked about celebrating mistakes. So I feel like when I look at medicine, for instance, and the challenge of acknowledging medical error for those who practice medicines, here's something that's highly scientific and yet because of the stakes and because of the context and because we're in a capitalist society and because there are people who are ready to sue a doctor the minute they admit medical error, how do we create a context in which scientists can actually in public revel in their mistakes, acknowledge their mistakes and lead us into that process that you were talking about of understanding how we made these mistakes when there are so many forces at work that actually contradict um, this core tenet of the scientific method. I mean, in some sense, I sort of feel like what we're what we're trying to teach, um, and and ideally, you would end up with a society that really has understood this is uh, the the idea that we're, in some sense, we're skiing, you know, down a probabilistic world in which things change, and that you you can't just lock your knees and you know and know the answer um, when you start at the top of the hill. That you're that you, we're working with a world of 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 things that are different and things and and discoveries along the way that make us realize that we have to adjust our course. And that that's not our failure mode. That's actually our success mode. And that when we don't do that is, is when we run into trouble. Um, I, to some extent, I, it, it's interesting that I, I still feel like we hear a little bit about this in the, in the business world that they've started to sort of uh, catch on to teaching about this. But I'm not sure that the public has started to recognize this as it's, it's actually pervasive in everything they need to ask the scientists for help with. I agree. I mean, I think we actually were talking about thousands of years of pressure here on, on on this idea of 
making mistakes. In, in the way Greek tragedy is taught in most high school classes is that the central character has a flaw, often called a fatal flaw. In Greek, the word that defines that flaw that is hamartia, which in Greek means to miss the mark. I miss the mark a thousand times a day. It's how I learn. It's how I adjust. It's how I, if you don't miss the mark, you'll never learn your way you know, on the subway in New York City, you have to miss the mark in order to learn. It's part of the process of, uh, of, of being human. And it wasn't until the New Testament when the word became sin and carried all this sort of moral weight, this idea that missing the mark was a moral failing, that I think it became inculcated in our culture, this idea that to make a mistake was, you know, not, it was a fa- not just a fatal flaw, but it was something to be reviled and something to be not celebrated but marginalized. Um, so I, there's something I think at the, at the heart of tragedy, um, and maybe it's been misinterpreted over the years. I think you're watching characters make mistakes and form habits. And of course they learn too late and then you watch them destroy themselves and their families and generations to come. But in so doing, you're able to step back and think about something I think it's really critical for science to be able to convey and think about as well, which is the stakes of our choices. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Saul, is, you know, one of the things that the sort of presumptions I have about science and about medicine is that, um, you know, you're trained as scientists not to uh, emote, that, that in, to express emotion in an inappropriate way, in some way uh, undermines the perception of the sort of purity of the scientific approach. And um, you see this in medicine, you see this in other fields as well. Um, and what tragedy can bring to the table that maybe science traditionally hasn't been able to do, hasn't get, been given permission to do, is express the emotions that are actually appropriate when talking about ecological collapse or a pestilence that's killed a three million people. That when talking about lives lost, it's very hard to step back and talk in a clinical way. And in talking with you, you sort of upended and rearranged my molecules with regard to the role of emotion in in, in the sciences, and, and I'd love to hear you talk more about what you said. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there are a few angles on that that, that, that that I think we were starting to discuss, but one, one of them that I, I, I've been thinking very much about when we've been teaching uh, this course is that um, we're trying to, along with teaching all these, you know, classical tools of, of rationality and uh, and hunting for ways in which we make error and and, and fixing them, um, you know, the you can almost think of them as the, you know, the Mr. Spock um, you know, side of the story. Um, there, there is, we, we've also been coming, realizing that, of course, we have to get to the topic of how do you bring all of that, all those techniques and tricks of the trade of rationality to the table, which includes the table of values and goals and fears and emotions and desires. Um, because if you, we've been saying in this course is that if you don't come up with a principled way to weave those together when you make a decision, the part that you're going to leave behind is the rationality. I mean, it's clear that mm. it's all the other things that bring people to a, to the point of a decision. Um, and so in some sense, it's our job, um, if we're taking seriously the sciences and the, and the rationality, um, it's our job to help ask what is a principled way to get that into the discussion with the values and the goals. And, and, and it's not, and, and, and in that sense, we have to be very open to them. We have to be really wet, ready to include them um, in the discussion, because um, you know, in some sense, we're the ones that, that will get pushed out of the story at the end of the day. Um, I mean, we, as th- that rational part of ourselves, um, will we'll get pushed away, and we all know that experience ourselves. I mean, it's not that the scientists haven't had that experience in their own lives, um, but I think that we now need to start thinking about how, as a society, do we start to, um, in a principled way, bring all these pieces together um, when we make a decision. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that becomes part of our job then, uh, that, as I was saying, that's, that we probably hadn't recognized before. Yeah, so it sounds like there's, to ignore the emotions is at the peril of science, that, that emotions are critical to our decision-making faculties and they can't really be separated from our rational faculties. And I, I feel like that speaks to a binary, a false binary that's at the center, it's been at the center of tragedy for all time. You know, Plato and his Republic froze the poets out of the ideal uh, Republic in um, or Socrates and Plato's Republic, and because the poets, the tragic poets, have the capacity to sway our emotions and thereby sway our decisions and behavior. And um, so there's been this, in, in Western culture, this kind of baked in idea that we can't be emotional and ethically rigorous at the same time. We can't be 
having a, a highly rational, engaged discussion while being emotionally present in the ways that the subjects we're talking about kind of demand of us. And to cut ourselves off from those emotions actually is an injury to us as human beings. It, it, it's stifling something really critical. So one of the reasons we perform, and we will be in a few minutes on Zoom, um, performing ancient Greek tragedy to talk about science and talk about the environment is, I think, a similar goal. It's to bring emotions into a rational and ethical discussion that um, if we're all made aware of the stakes of the things we're talking about, that we're talking about lives, we're talking about crops, we're talking about uh, environments, we're talking about ecosystems, and we, and we have an emotional relationship to those things while we're talking, we can still have maybe all the more uh, a, a rigorous and um, principled conversation that's grounded ethically and emotionally at the same time. And, and I think one of the things you, that you, we were both discussing when we were talking earlier was that by bringing people, giving them a chance to think through, feel through their emotions, um, it often opens them up to being able to actually then stop and actually think rationally as well. And that, 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 that in some sense, you, you need one in order to be able to open up to the other um, in, in many situations. And I, and I think that's one of the things that we're about to see in the way you organize this, these uh, performances and then have conversation. Yeah, this is the first time we've talked about it before doing it, but all of our events result in a discussion that lasts longer than the performance in which in which the people who end up speaking and anyone can raise their hand and end up on the screen in this immense digital amphitheater in which we're performing with tens of thousands of people. Um, and hopefully we'll speak to a, from a place of emotional connection, but also um, of, of, sort of um, well-wrought and, and rigorous thinking that is being modeled at the same time. And, and the plays sort of create the context for this different kind of discourse to happen that I'm afraid in our culture of PowerPoints and of TED Talks and of lectures and panel discussions, um, it's very hard to move audiences into that space um, without the aid of uh, others who are willing to commit to the emotions. And that's the role of the actors in our model. And I know you've been bringing performance and, and poetry and other things into your scientific classes and um, into your curriculum. And it seems like there's just a lot of connections for us to continue to explore beyond this 15 minute exchange that we just had. Well, I'll look forward to it. And I'll look forward to watching this uh, uh, upcoming uh, participatory activity. So uh, are, are you <laughs> going to pass the ball over to the other uh, uh, channel in which people will be watching? I believe the host is going to come back on in just a second and lead everyone here through the instructions of how to access the link. But in 15 minutes uh, at uh, 3.30 Eastern or 15 minutes from now, we'll begin the broadcast in our Zoom environment, uh, which um, we've invited everyone to join us in along with a large public audience that will be joining from all over the planet. Um, and in that exchange, uh, we'll hear actors reading uh, my translation of Sophocles' Oedipus the King, followed by the gut responses of community members who are, uh, have something at stake with regard to the themes of uh, environmental justice and, and climate change. And, um, and then as soon as we've heard from those community members from Africa and South America and from uh, all parts of the world, we'll then open up the doors for truly democratic, pluralistic dialogue, where we invite people to be themselves and to enter into an exchange that is both emotionally and ethically charged at the same time. So we're excited to pass the baton over to the organizers of the summit. And I'm just grateful to have had this 15 minutes with you, Saul. What a pleasure it's been uh, getting to know you and hearing more about your book. Looking forward to more. <laughs>